Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. It's time for your daily dose of insanity over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast with your hosts, Jair Handley and me, Chris Winder. Just two nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions. A place where the sky's the limit, space is the place, and nerds run the world. Without further ado... All right, and welcome to another episode. Today, as our Yay. special guest, we have William S. Frisbee Jr., <laughs> although we just call him Bill. Yay! He's the uh, son of a soldier, so at least his, uh, his dad got it right, who even uh, who got even and joined the Marine Corps. He's had a lot of jobs, administrative assistant in an office, U.S. Marine <laughs> Infantry Squad Leader. Hoorah! That's for you. Sure. Uh, uh, security lieutenant, help desk technician, and computer consultant. He's traveled quite a bit, living in Europe, Germany specifically, for about eight years in various states from Hawaii to California and Texas, <laughs> Oklahoma, Missouri, Florida, 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 and even Kentucky. And I will remember to speak, I promise. Uh, he's lived in Okinawa and traveled to Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Hong Kong, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. Hmm. So, yes, he has lots of fr- frequent flyer miles. Uh, these days, he's mostly a computer consultant, husband, and dad. Um, and yes, if you thought that sound can, because Yay! we did another lazy show prep day <laughs> and stole it from his official bio. Yay! Did we get everything right? Did I mess up? No, you did good. Outstanding. I was good waiting for someone to say one day, wait, I'm not Bob. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> we'll just start over. Did you get the right notes? It's going to happen. <laughs> Knock on wood. Oh, yeah. Oop, I like the way you think, Chris. See? All right. So uh, the, the next part of the uh, the introduction that we always do is we talk about how we met our guest. Um, for today, for uh, for Bill, um, I actually met him through a, a Google search, if you would. So I Googled military science fiction and um, found his MilSF website, and which uh, will be in the show notes. And we'll go over that again at the end with all the links as usual. And started stalking him online as you do. You know, when you find interesting people, you just stalk them. <laughs> so shh, don't tell him it's me peeping in the windows, though. <laughs> well, like everybody what else. About you, Chris? Where did you uh, first cool, find good famous, old Bill? Infamous, geeky, and good to know. I met him through JR. And I'm so convinced that JR literally knows everyone. Um, so JR kept hinting and teasing and and making me wonder what I should be writing about and and how I should be writing military science fiction and kept referencing that there was something coming in the future. He couldn't tell me what, but there was, there was something important that I should read coming in the future. And then once I finally got the book, I wasn't sure I wanted to do the interview because I didn't want to share this resource. I wanted to keep it all to myself. I'm greedy. It's a fact. It's it's like it's like it's like giving the enemy a big stack of ammo, saying, "No, no, no! Don't use it against me." Let's be fair. I gave it to you. Don't forget. <laughs> well, I mean, I told you as much as Bill would let me. That's but, okay. I know, understand top secret project. I didn't want to get blown and, up either. Yeah. Uh, in all fairness, it's fair to share it with everybody else. Plus, you know, I'm so, sure he'd like to sell a few more books. Yeah. Always. Sometimes that does help keep so the Bill, lights on. So, Bill, what do you what do you love about science right. fiction? What what has drawn you to this genre? Oh, everything. I like what I like about science fiction is that it's not the here and now. The here and now is the present. Science fiction it it's different in that it's not what is, but what can be. And I think ever since I've been knee high to a grasshopper, I've been. It here is not the here and now is boring. I like to to look forward and see other places and stuff like that. So that's what's always drawn me about science fiction. I mean, when Battlestar Galactica first came out, like oh, hundred yeah. years ago, um, I love that show. Same with uh, Doctor Who. I couldn't get enough of it. Okay, do you remember the name of the little the little robot that wore the the robot called Doc around his neck? The the, the one that looked you like had, he had a bowl cut. The robot, I, the the dog robot. You had Boxy. That was no, the kid. The, yeah, yeah. The, the one that looked oh. like the kid was Boxy. Or are you talking? No, the kid was Boxy. I thought. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe that was a dog. Gosh, it's been so long. <laughs> Nobody remembers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've got a picture in my head. If you're talking about the kid, he yeah. actually showed up in the new one, but he had like no role. 
but they never brought back the dog, the robot yeah, dog. Yeah, I missed the dog. Yeah. Ah, well. <laughs> well, I have learned something today, though, as I update the notes so, you know, I remember what he says. I, I, you know, that way we can reference back for some uh, on-the-spot questions. And I type in Battlestar Galactica, and it does not like the word Galactica, Damn. proving word pro- programmers are not nerds. I have to fix it on my auto Because otherwise they would fix this. Yeah, learn word. It is just not right. Yes. If you're listening, Microsoft, fix this. I'm just saying. All right, carry on. So, so was it Battlestar Galactica or another show or something else? Like, like with me, I don't even remember the name of the show, but there was there was this cartoon that had the a giant battleship that could turn into a robot called the STF One. And I have no idea what what show that was, but I remember seeing that when I was about five years old. What's your earliest memory of sci-fi? My earliest – it'd probably be Battlestar Galactica, if not uh, the Yamamoto of uh, Star Blazers. Oh, I don't remember that one. One of those two. Oh, you haven't seen Star Blazers? I have. You uh, still seeing that song. Some good, some good stuff in there. Yeah. Hmm. When was that back here? Are you going to sing the song for us? Oh. <laughs> uh, you want listeners to stay on, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you. All right. What's your, so don't sing. What's your, earliest memory of, what's your earliest memory of playing games in the genre? Are you, are you a console gamer, a PC gamer, or board uh, gamer? I started out with Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, yeah. That was like in elementary school. I think. Mm -hmm. And then that took me on. And then I remember getting into gamma world, but I could never get anybody to play gamma world and then space opera. And then there were star frontiers as far as computer games. Good gosh. I think that one of the first computer games I started playing that was sci-fi was wing commander. (laughs) Wing commander. (laughs) I remember that. Dragons and wing commander. That's pretty much universal for everybody. Yeah. For all the cool kids anyway. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good background. We weren't cool back then, though. You played Dungeons and no. Dragons. You were definitely a pariah. No, yeah, a uh, <laughs> Satan worshiper of the worst kind. I, right. I actually didn't Probably play as a kid. sister. <laughs> so you played after you became an adult. Yeah, I, I yeah. had two sessions as an adult, and that's it. And then everyone oh. kept moving. I'd like to get back into it, but it's like all that copious free time I don't have. Um, yeah, makes it right. Yeah, That's I'd like right. to get back into it too, and there's just there's no time, and getting the group together, and nobody else has time. Yep, yep. So everybody has kids and careers now. Oh yeah, the man keeping us down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, how did your love of the genre specifically translate into writing instructional novels for authors? Well, see, the first time I joined the Marine Corps. And then I went to see a movie, and it was like, my gosh, what are they thinking? You know, when I was watching that movie. So then I started. I wanted to educate people, so back in the '90s, I created a website, and I started writing down a lot of my thoughts about you know where warfare is going, the way small unit tactics work, and stuff like that. And this was probably '97, hmm. '98. I think it's the first time I created the website. Um. And that's, I just wanted to educate people. I wanted to see a better quality of movie, better quality of book. And that's just kind of how I made that transition. And it's been an experience. So little by little, what'd you use? Like Angel Fire? Remember Angel Fire? I used Notepad to make a website. Oh, oh. Oh yeah, I did. I did it old it school. Our way. <laughs> yeah, I did it old school. Yeah, notepad um, is the only right way. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Wow, you nerds! Wow, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I can turn it on. Well, I couldn't I afford on, anything else. I can turn the on-off button on my Xbox. Hey, I'm probably the biggest luddite nerd you'll meet because I'm horrible at technology. I'm where good technology goes to die and crash. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember building websites using angelfire.com as the host because it was free. Mm-hmm. And I think Yahoo had a free. GeoCities. Oh, GeoCities, that's it. Yeah. Oh, GeoCities was awesome. Yeah, I think I yeah, played with GeoCities and Middle for Dummies. Mm-hmm. And I put together, mm-hmm. I had a service provider that gave us a free website. And it's oh, still nice. out there, actually. Warcat.qx.net, I think. Okay. And okay. I haven't been with them in like over a decade. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, remember the, um, stuff up. do you remember the iconic loading sequence when you were first going on, when it was AOL, the, that noise and then the dots oh, yeah. and the beeps and the screeches? I, I never that, did AOL. Gotten, mm-hmm. AOL. I did CompuServe, but I didn't <gasps> do AOL. Yeah, I, I remember, remember CompuServe. When, yeah. I remember when we actually got the second line so that way you could get on the internet without closing the phone down <laughs> or getting yeah. kicked off when someone called in. Right. I didn't uh, want to talk to anyone uh, back then. I one line if I'm online you're not talking to me. The yeah, dark but days when, of the internet. When I was younger my my family had, you know, a say in and whether the phone was usable. <laughs> so, I know. And I had two <laughs> sisters that were always on the phone with whoever. Ooh. Yeah. So, so go back to your writing. Mm-hmm. It kind of sounds like you're a lot like me. When you see someone doing something wrong, mm-hmm. you kind of want to fix it. it w- would you say that inspired your tactical writing? Yeah. K- kind of uh, what you were talking about before? Yeah. I, I just – and I want to read better quality stuff. When I read someone else and they're kind of like missing some things, it's like I got to step back from it. But a lot of what inspired it is I wanted to help other people because not everybody joined the Marine Corps Infantry. And right. The smart ones joined the Army questions. Infantry. What? We could argue that one. <laughs> 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 you know, when I grew up yeah, in Germany. I joined as a 2512. I actually saw the Army training, and I, I went to Army JROTC. Mm-hmm. So, and I spent seven years in Germany working closely with the Army. And as a high schooler, so I, I got to see a lot of the army. My mother was actually in the army, so my okay. mother wore combat boots. And then while I was movie too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw a lot of the army, and then of course with my uncles and my cousins, they were all army. So I had to go Marine Corps. You know the the, the <laughs> motto at the time had was, to show them up. Yeah, be all you can be. It's like okay, that was what it was when I enlisted. In fact, my dad did twenty three years in the um, in the navy as an engine man. And so the running joke as a kid was, I'd rather my daughter work in a house of ill repute than my son join the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually first talked to the, uh, to the Marine recruiter just to get even, mm-hmm. um, but they weren't doing the split. Um, what do you call it? The split training at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, where you could go, like I went to boot camp as a junior in high school between my junior and senior year. And then I went back after I graduated for AIT. Mm-hmm. Um, that just wasn't an option. Of course, literally days after I signed the contract with the Army and had been to the maps, they called, oh, we've got a slot. If you just sign up. I was like, oh, too late. <laughs> so, but and, and then I made it even better. Are you familiar with the, the Navy at all? Did you deal with the, the ships yeah. or were oh, you yeah. mostly? I've got several months so, ship time. So in the Navy, I guess the bosun's mates and the engine men have like a little bit of a rivalry. Mm-hmm. And so when I enlisted in the army, it was as an army bosun's mate to my dad's engine man. <laughs> uh, of course, they uh, they phased the unit I was supposed to join out, and I ended up in the infantry. Uh-huh. But it wasn't what I intended. I was just trying to stick it to my dad. <laughs> yeah, my mother threatened to disown me if I joined the army. Which Did wasn't she gonna really? Stop me, oh, yeah, which wouldn't have stopped me. But the marine recruiter called me. Okay, and I was going to go enlist in the army, and you know, and but the marine recruiter called me, and it's like, huh. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> right. And then the rest was history. So, oh, then you thought about it a lot during boot camp. Uh, oh. Oh. I kept I thinking I in, in boot camp that the Air Force would have been so much sweeter. Yeah. Well, been, now they've got co-ed you. barracks and. See, I, I did my um, when I enlisted in the in the reserves, and then ended up getting mm-hmm. federalized because of the, the war on terror. But when I enlisted, they were letting people that did close combat support for infantry units, which I was in a riverine uh, squadron, or I was supposed to um, small boats. And so they sent me to uh, infantry OSUT at Fort Benning, and mm-hmm. so I did all of the same stuff they did. And it was just so when I 
got to the unit that I was supposed to join and they said, hey, there's no unit here. It shut down, you know, a decade before you were born. But oh, by the way, you've got this nice shiny infantry training. So it just sort of, it was fate, I guess. Wow. Yeah. But, See, I wouldn't guaranteed infantry. I wanted infantry. There was no two ways about it for me. Well, I was just doing it for college. I was going to get a commission and then, you know, the war happened and then two deployments and an injury. It just, you know, mm-hmm. I had planned on going infantry as an officer, but as far as the enlisted stuff, I just, whatever was fun was because, you know, it's the reserves. I remember my yeah. recruiter telling me that the, uh, the reserves would only get called up after the women's auxiliary and the boy scouts. <laughs> because it just wouldn't happen and in fact in 98 cnn did a special about world peace might finally be attainable mm-hmm. yeah, so that, that, that the joke yeah they got that wrong <laughs> so the joke was on me but uh so back to your books because we could nerd out over this this military stuff forever um you've written a lot of military themed manuals for the airsoft mm-hmm. crowd so here's a sampling for the listeners he's written the airsoft bible book of calm the airsoft bible book of tactics um, you've written a the conglomerate trilogy, which is science fiction, mm-hmm. and your current book, which was just out, writing military science fiction for infantry. And I understand there's going to be some follow-ons for space combat and uh, fleets and and the like. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we're going to focus on your writing manuals, just because it's a chance to nerd out about military science fiction, and who doesn't love that. Yeah. Um, and so obviously those all sound fascinating, but, um, in full disclosure, just because I, I want to be honest, I did beta read the, uh, the military science fiction infantry novel. So I am a little biased cause I did enjoy it. So we're just, we'll just put that out there. <laughs> I'm a little biased too, for full disclosure, because I've only had the time to get through the, the preface where he explains what the book's going to be about. And already I've doubled what I know. <laughs> well, I, I used it. So I'm loving it. I didn't have time to do the page by page read. Cause it's a thick manual. I mean, what'd you say? It was something like 200,000 words. 140,000. That's what, so it's, it's, it's impressive. Wow. There's and it's, um, it's a lot of, of factual data, which means you're, you're going to read it a little slower if you're reading it. Um, and so what I did is I was just getting to the point where I was writing my super secret project that I've alluded to, uh, that we'll be announcing sometime later this month. And so normally what I would do is I have a stack of reference manuals, the infantry man- squad manual, the company tactics manual, and all the other, the basic soldier skills, all the manuals that all the military people have access to. I kept mine. So I would reference them. And so you're cross-referencing a lot of books. What Bill did was he put all that information in one place. So I tested it while I wrote that book and used it for, re- uh, for reference to check, you know, like how far would an infantry squad be able to march in an hour, you know, carrying full rucksack and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's in there. So it's definitely very uh, user-friendly. And that was the whole goal. Yeah. Cool info. Thank you. I, I you know, originally I wrote a book for airsoft cause I, I used to play airsoft a lot and a lot of clueless individuals. So then I got into that and then I saw the website was kind of there. And so I just kind of picked up on that and I do have a whole bookshelf full of military manuals that I, I referenced a lot of to put that together. So I've cool. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a bunch of them too. I kept all of mine. In <laughs> fact, this is going to sound funny. So when I enlisted in the army in, uh, in 99, they had in the basic soldier skills manual, uh, where it says a good soldier will sleep when and where they can, because you never know when you'll be able to sleep again. Mm-hmm. You, meaning, you know, you don't, you know, spend all your time. What, messing around i'm trying to keep this pg and not cuss and this is very hard when we're talking about this stuff but so you know obviously you don't want to stay up all night you know binge watching game of thrones if you've got to be up at four in the morning because who knows what the day will bring kind of thing and so they had to remove that from the basic soldier manual i still have the original because soldiers especially the the privates were using that when they sham out of work they'd hide and they'd have that page bookmark and it said sir Hmm. So, so uh, those manuals can be a lot of fun if you know how to read them. You can, yeah. you can get yourself into or out of a lot of trouble with those things. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of good ones, and you know, since I got out, I, when I was in, I kept all my manuals. So I kept all my you know infantry patrolling and stuff like that. And then when I got out, I still collect those books. So if I find a good okay. one on Amazon, I'll order it, and 
I've got like the army officers course and all sorts of oddball books. And the, uh, the ranger yep. one where it talks about, uh, the creation of all that kind of yep. stuff. It's, it's definitely good fodder mm-hmm. for thought. I think I've got the ranger so. one from the eighties and then the newer one. I got the one from early two thousands. I think was when I bought mine. So whatever the, the edition was then. Yeah. So. Yeah. And they change. So, so why don't you give us an overview of what's in this book without, uh, uh, I guess, without as spoiling. much as I could fit. Um, I, I started working on book <laughs> one, or I started working on a book, and I said, okay, I'm going to have three sections in it. I'm going to have infantry, I'm going to have spaceships, I'm going to have ground vehicles and, and squadrons and fighters and stuff. And then I just got to a point, it's like, <laughs> this isn't going to fit in one book. So I've had to break it apart. <laughs> and then my goal was to, it was a bear just organizing everything in such a way that it made sense. You know, there's just so much information, you know, the psychology, you know, what does it take to pull the trigger on somebody, you know, uh, some terminology in the military, what are small unit tactics like? And it's just such a wide range. And I pulled a lot of different sites and forums see what kind of questions were asked so i got those and i use that as a list and it's just and even now i'm still watching and i've i'm getting a list for the follow-on volume you know okay do you think there'll uh, be a version two of this book later on Uh, there's (laughs) i can't cram enough in that one yeah things update right you know, there, there's got to be. So have you read? Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Have you too. read the uh, On Killing, the psycholo- yes. Psychological Cost of Learning to Kill in War and Society? Yep. From David Dressler. I've read that one too. Yeah. So. He's got yeah. another book out too on combat, and that focuses more on police. And that's got more details in it as far as uh, the physiology and oh. what happens and how, you know, an officer or someone, they could be firing their weapon and they can hear the enemy firing, but they can't hear themselves firing. And it's just really fascinating some of those aspects, um, right? Okay. That's why that's why they never really ask a cop how many mm-hmm. shots he fired. Yeah, he, he might not even know. know he fired. He just my gun wasn't working. It, yeah, you just go count the rounds. And now mm-hmm. I, I have heard um, cool. some of his questioning his um, his assessment about whether they were actually shooting to kill in previous wars. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, on the research side, it's definitely an interesting question. It's something if you're writing military science fiction, you need to consider, um, especially in a as we've progressed as a society, we are a lot less willing to accept combat losses, and life becomes mm-hmm. more precious. So, the act of taking life becomes something more difficult to manage. I think, and I think that boils down to our actual lifestyle. Like back in World War II, a lot of people might have lived on a farm or they were more basic in that, you know, okay, I've got a chicken. I got to cut its head off and I'm going to prepare it. So people were more close to that. Yeah. They were more exposed. So they had that, that, you know, they understood it better. Mm-hmm. And But now people are like, you know, they, they don't experience death. They don't, they don't understand. They might have lost a pet, but that was like years ago. And it's not a daily right. thing for them. Right. And plus, with the video games in our society, um, we're just de- we're we're not not dehumanizing, but we're kind of programming people. You know that killing is okay and that killing's acceptable, and it, it's until it actually yeah. happens, and then it, and then they then realize it bothers them a lot. PTSD yeah. plays into that a lot as well. I think a lot, at least with the PTSD, I wonder how much of that is because so much fewer, so the number of people that serve are so much smaller that it used to be when you came home from World War II, like you would have your neighbor, you know, the guy down Mm -hmm. the street, whatever, you could talk to someone if you needed to. So you didn't feel as alone. Whereas now, I mean, you might not ever see someone again, unless you stay in a military town like I did, who was there when you Mm -hmm. were there and saw what you saw. So, and I also think even then, if you take that and extrapolate it within the military, the, um, the tooth to tail ratio, while it's gotten small, that's the, uh, the amount of troops it takes to support an infantry 
or a combat troop versus, you know, how many in the rear supporting them. Mm -hmm. And while it takes less to support um, a ground combat force now than it used to, I think the lifestyles are so far removed. Like talk to someone that just lived on the fob. I mean, they had AC and Mm -hmm. Pizza Hut and Burger King and, you know, Never left the I sweated sand and ate MREs and, you know what yeah. I mean? Like it, it's a, it can be a <laughs> combat experience yeah. if you want to even call that combat. And I, I'm not taking that away from them, but I mean, just the, the disparity even within the ranks is so huge now. Mm-hmm. And that's only going to grow. I think as, as combat becomes more asymmetrical, yeah. but right. asymmetrical and, and with drones, it yeah. becomes less personal as well. Yeah. There was a big, um, kerfuffle if you would about giving um combat um status pay etc to um to drone operators yeah i remember that because they were because they were sitting in the u.s and some kind of metal or something that they were getting yeah they were trying to give them the combat action badge from the in the army at least i think or an equivalent thereof and it's like eh I mean, yeah. what you did counts. I'm not taking that away, but it, it, your boots weren't in the mud sweating and, yeah. and you know, you it's, it's different. I don't know. Right. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to steal the show from Chris because I do that sometimes. And um, so how did you come up? This was supposed to be his question, but I, I'm fascinated and I don't want to wait for him to get around to it. <laughs> So how did you come up with the idea for the series when you talk about the specific tactical stuff in the manual? Like uh, not the, uh, the broad idea was obviously you saw errors in the market and you wanted to fix it and fill the niche. But as far as like, when you start talking at the granular granular little can't speak today at the, the small level, like for the average, mm-hmm. you know, boot on the ground, when you talk about tactics from that level and you do in your book, how do you envision that? Like, where do you start from today and extrapolate or, yeah, um, I start from my experience and extrapolate from there. Um, I, I never see anybody writing books about this, the little guy, the, the infantryman, how that combat works. They're always like, you know, the battalion moved here and there. Um, but I, I take it from my experience because in, in the Marine Corps, I was called Robo Grunt or Techno Grunt because I love technology. And I was always trying to find the newest, latest, greatest, you know, little piece of web gear or what have you to test and all that. And I loved soldier of fortune and I was always ordering stuff online or not online, but through, <laughs> you know, mail. And I just love technology and I kept figuring, you know, well, how, how is this going to change combat? And it, back then, if I'd had a chance, I would have been that one of those guys with like every attachment available on my M4. <laughs> um, to you've, been, you've been the, the, the you mall know, ninja. Been twice the regular weight. <laughs> <laughs> the laser, the light, the the scope, the extra sights, the three bands. You know, so that, that's where I, <laughs> yeah. So that's where I take it from. I take it from the ground. You know, what's the what what's going to be like for the infantryman in the in the mud? And then I work my way up from there. Did you see? That's what I tried to do when I write. I don't know how well I do it, but that, that was sort of the starting point for my series. Now, when you deployed, did they actually give you uh, a? a bayonet was that even something like we trained on them but we were never issued one i carried a k-bar instead and and a pilot survival knife uh one of my nicknames uh was nine knives um i carried a lot of knives i had a world (laughs) war one bayonet and then they did issue us regular bayonets we weren't i kept that my yeah we i kept mine in my butt pack because i was never going to use it i had other better knives and we were never going to fix bayonets and if we were, I had uh, one of the brand new Army M9 bayonets that I'd acquired. <laughs> we actually had a uh, situation where our, our LT ordered us to fix bayonets. Of course, nobody had them. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we had um, – Oops. We were escorting a, a unit out of Nevada. Uh, I ran the convoy escorts, uh, and they, this was a convoy unit out of Nevada. And the, um, the LT in charge was a former light infantry Marine who went um, – got out, went national guard as a way to pay for college and, and all of that. And so we ended up getting boxed in, um, in, in a s- square in, uh, in Karbala. <laughs> and, uh, we're, we're escorting ammo of all things. So we've got trucks hauled with filled with connex boxes <laughs> of ammo 
and we got lost because the LT, not this LT, the other one that was in charge, uh, had us turn right when we should have turned left on this road. And so we get uh. boxed in. So, you know, he just circle the wagons essentially and wait for them to figure it out. And of course, once you stop, you've got to protect your perimeter. And we start, Ooh. we started taking fire from one of the buildings. And so light infantry tactics is you fix bayonets and you charge the objective so you can get under their fire. But of course, he's telling us that when we've got civilians to protect. And oh, by the way, nobody's got that bayonet. <laughs> I, I yeah, did it, find and this got me in a little bit of trouble, but I did find when bayonets fail, uh, explosive grenades win. And gotta love Mark 19. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, they are great. I love firing those. Yeah, level a few buildings, but you know, mm-hmm. what are you gonna do? But we're at the uh, half hour mark, so let's take a moment and uh, have a word from our sponsor. Hey listeners, Josh Hayes here, co-host of Keystroke Medium. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Sci-Fi Shenanigans. I tell you, we're really excited about what JR and Chris are doing with the podcast and are proud to feature them as part of our podcast partner network. When you get done listening to this episode, I'd like to invite you to come check out our own podcast at keystrokemedium.com. You can find all our previous episodes and check out all the amazing authors we've had on the show. If you're free on Mondays, mark your calendars for 11 a.m. Come hang out with us as we talk to today's leading science fiction and fantasy authors and other industry professionals. We've got a great live audience who get into a lot of shenanigans of their own, as JR and Chris can attest. That's every Monday morning at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, live on Keystroke Media. We're going to talk about some reading, we're going to talk about some writing, and of course, everything in between. And now I'll let you get back to some more shenanigans with JR and Chris. Have a great day. All right. Thank you to those wonderful sponsors. They're the best. Everyone says so. I say so. And that's all that really matters, right, people? Oh, yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. so so let's back to get uh, to talking to Bill. Um, so we, we've talked about your infantry manual for, for writing military science fiction, and you've talked about other manuals that will follow which uh, I'm excited to, uh, to beta read those as well. But let's stop shamelessly plugging you and talk about the genre writ large now. Um, so we're going to specifically look at how they did things right, what they did wrong, et cetera, all things military. And we'll just try to narrow our focus away from our own deployments and back to what we love to read. So what are you uh, reading in the genre and, and what are you seeing as far as trends, the good, the bad, and the ugly for Mill SF? Um, I'm seeing a lot of infantry and small unit tactics coming out as well. Um, you know, right now I'm reading like Terra Nova, almost finished with that one. Oh, that's good. And I got to go back and read Ember Wars. I did. I haven't read that yet, which is brutal. But it was um, good. That was where I started. Yeah, I realized I've I've got it. I just have like 1,200 books on my Kindle, and 400 of them are read. Um, but <laughs> yeah. I always like to, to read Marines and stuff like that. And I, I really think the genre, you've got two military science fiction areas that I've seen. You've got the infantry, the, the Marine, the low level, you know, the grunt, and then you've got the mm-hmm. fleet. So you've got but those in, two uh, different, nothing in between. Except in the, in the Amazons, which is what we try to use as our, our compass, at least for that, just because it's easy, they categorize military SF and they break it down to space fleet and space marine mm-hmm. is the, the distinction. Yeah. There's a few I've seen that fit in between, um, but not uh, that I many. Just to ask. I just wanted to ask what kind of thing would be in between. Um, be starfighters. You know, oh, it's not the big like close air support. Uh-huh. Individual starfighters. Um, I know of two authors there's that do that, and uh, they seem to do it pretty good. And they've got a really good knowledge on, you know, squadron operations. Pretty good reads. And what uh, which books are these or authors? So um, one is like this: the Spiral Arm. Oh, by S. F. Edwards. Yeah, that one. He, he I think oh. he does a really good job you know, with the fighter pilots in their world. And he doesn't concentrate on the big battleships going at it like uh, some of the other authors. Um, and then the other one funny, is Don Kyle. Funny fact, real quick, funny fact about SF Edwards, aside from mm-hmm. he writes science fiction and his initials are SF, he actually designs airplanes by his, as his day job. It shows. He, he knows <laughs> fighter ops. <laughs> Like he he desi- like he'll design them and then he'll print three D models of them to make sure yeah. it works and you know it would be like aerodynamic and all that and like 
I did an interview of him on my blog before we started the podcast, and he was sending me all the schematics and stuff. Mm-hmm. It was impressive. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he 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 locks that down. He's I think he does a good job there. But he's one of the ones that would fit in between. Um, the other one I've seen would be like uh, Don Kyers, and I'm probably missing up that last name. But he writes the Enlightenment Protocols, and he's a an old Army veteran. But he's got really good detail in that that center. He likes to do a lot of infantry stuff, but then he also goes with flight operations and a little bit of fleet. So he nice. would okay. be fitting right in the middle there. And I thought he had some pretty good, you know, starfighter uh, operations. Okay. All right. Well, we'll have those uh, books he referenced in the show notes. Now, if you were going to name, we have sp- the Amazon calls it space fleet and space Marine. If mm-hmm. you were going to name that in between, what would you call it? <sighs> Squadron operations. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, I'd probably say like squadron operations or vehicles. I think that would work. Yeah. So, so what's the best example of troops that you've seen in sci-fi? It could be movies. It could be books. It can be anything. Yeah, I don't want to go to your movies because I don't like the Starship Troopers. That totally misses the book. But <laughs> yeah, but that was a good movie. Yeah. It, well, I, I actually mean, haven't seen the, movie. the two. I've read the book. I. I couldn't bring myself to watch the movie. <laughs> I've read the book and watched the movie. If you can accept that there's two separate entertainment venues that just mm-hmm. happen to have the same name, it's a good movie for what it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll take your word for it. I hear the graphics are great. Um, yeah, they're, they're not bad. So it, it's, it's, it's a little on the B movie side, a mm-hmm. little corny, but uh, yeah, yeah, but I love I, me I some, no idea some about the cheesy B movies. I love cheesy B movies <laughs> like uh, werewolf Nazis take on the allied forces or something crazy. Yeah, Sharknado. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, so they were smoking a little something, something when they were writing that script. I don't care. I'll also watch. Well, I saw right, an interesting so, thing. How so what, parody, but, um, uh, go ahead. So what are the best troops? Um, so I, no, no, he was going to tell us something. Yeah, uh, there's Outriders. Have you guys read Outriders? I have not. Tell us about it. That is actually pretty cool. Um, It's about a special forces uh, soldier. And basically the premise is is they send him, they kill him. And they kill him so they can capture his persona or something like that. So if he goes out on a mission and gets killed, they can clone him and bring him back. And and it talks about a war with Mars. And it's actually pretty cool and pretty gritty. Um, Have you read uh, B.V. Larson's Undying Mercenary yes. series? Has something yep. similar? Yeah. I enjoyed that as well. That had a lot of that, you know, where you back your brain up essentially and then they spit out a new copy. Yeah. And that was more, so. that makes me think video games. You know, you get killed, you reset, and you're back at it. <laughs> Except for there were, I mean, it, it, they covered the emotion, at least B.V. Larson did. He covered like how that affects you emotionally. Mm-hmm. Are you still you mm-hmm. if the original you died, you know? And then he covered the there's the con- the concept of the permanent death, meaning if you weren't backed up, mm-hmm. um, or, or if if they can't, uh, they, there's like galactic rules. So like if uh, they can't confirm that you died, if they don't have a, if they haven't like eyeballed your body, mm-hmm. then they can't reprint you because they can't have two of you floating around. Yep. So you know you had to die where somebody lived to say yes, they all died. Yeah. So I mean, there was still the risk. It was just less yeah i've i got to like book three of that series i think it's book three but it's been a while since i've read it that was a pretty good series um he's on like six or seven now i've enjoyed all of them okay i highly recommend it after the good stuff what's the without naming any specific names because we try not to bash other authors here but what what are some bad things you're seeing happening with troops in science fiction um most of them aren't Military writers, they don't focus on it so much, but I'm not going to mention names um, and nobody here, but I I see a lot of bad authors. They think (laughs) infantry are dumb. You know, they're just they're only good at carrying a rifle. And, you know, I hate to see, Okay, yeah, the 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 special forces come at us and they're just shooting at us. No, um, they're going to flank you and do all sorts of other nasty things. Um, So it's Mm -hmm. like when I see stuff like that, it's like, okay, they've got no clue. 
And it bothers me. So it's me. lazy writing. Yeah, lazy writing. They don't understand. They think that two groups, when they get together, they just throw bullets at each other until one of them gets lucky. And <laughs> <laughs> that's not how it works. They just stand there. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think what mind. gets me the most is – <laughs> what gets me is the uh, the idea that the weapon is just a tool that's interchangeable. Mm-hmm. Like they don't realize that for a lot of us, it has personality. Mm-hmm. It, it becomes a part of you, and it, it it's more than just a tool. Like uh, the, all the rifles might look the same, but I could tell you which one was mm-hmm. mine. And, and they're used it differently. Was different. It fired a little different. Right. And it, you know, I, I modified it just a little bit. You know, tweak the 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 aiming or whatever mm-hmm. like they're there even if it's just two m16 a2 side by side yeah. they're still not the same yeah because one is mine and the other is not yep <laughs> and yeah, i think a lot right. of authors a lot of authors miss that yeah. and i'm always reminded of that that um iconic scene from full metal jacket where they where they sort of incorporate that idea of this one is yours yeah this is my rifle there are many like it but this one is mine Without my rifle, yeah, I'm. And that is very religious. true. There's a there's a prayer for that. We learned in boot camp. I still remember yeah, part. Of I it. remember. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember all of it. <laughs> One too many head injuries. It makes some short term <laughs> memory a little bit difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, so we've. You, uh, another thing that kind of annoys me is when I see authors. Everybody has the same weapon. You know, there's no variation. You yes, don't have like I, I a agree. saw gunner. You don't have a grenadier, or they all have assault rifles That's, with grenade yeah. launchers. You know, it's like, well, no saw gunners, no anti, you know, tank gunners, no nobody with anti bunker missiles or anything like that. You know, it's just, and there's no specialization throughout the organization. It's just everybody's a gun carrier. They carry a rifle. Right. They're all Xerox copies mm-hmm. of each other. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I um, that was one of the things um, Tim Taylor brought me in to to address, and why my story evolved the way it did. I had to go back in time to get someone that had those skills because, I mean, it fit within the scope of his universe. Mm-hmm. They didn't have that because the alien overlords didn't want them to. But I mean, I, that is definitely a thing you see writ large. Yeah. Um, I think the difference is, is when he wrote book one, he didn't know as much as he did when he wrote book two. So he had to like sort of justify it in canon, um, <laughs> which, but Hey, I mean, that happens and, you know, everyone yeah. makes mistakes we have to fix. The best ones are ones that can fix it in book two and make it part of the story versus yeah. <laughs> having to release volume two. So I, I, I like the way he did it, but, but yeah, I've seen that in other books as well, where the weapons are interchangeable. Mm-hmm. He said, no, that's, I mean, you can in a pinch. I could pick your rifle up and fire it and probably hit pretty damn close to what I'm aiming at, but dang close, yeah. dang close. Um, but the, yeah, that is. Well, so you, what's the best? In technology, too, you got to keep in mind that you pick up a weapon, it's probably going to integrate with your scope or your you know heads up display. So yeah, technically, you right can pick it up and start moving yeah. it around. You know, and different weapons have different ballistic characteristics so you pick it up it identifies itself as you know a mark ii rifle here's the ballistic qualities here's the battle side zero and you're ready to go yeah but this is one of the things i learned i was getting out right as all the the scope stuff Mm -hmm. was was going you know mainstream in the army so um, I actually got in trouble for for cheating on a uh, weapons qual because I didn't use the scope. I used iron sight for both rounds. You were supposed to do qualify once with iron sights and once without or once with the scope. Mm-hmm. I just did iron sights both times because that's what I knew. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the middle of a firefight, when the sandstorms are kicking and the weather isn't cooperating and mm-hmm. you know getting banged and beat around, technology fails. Yeah. So you have to have that fallback. And I think that's one thing people forget. They make, and that's another, I guess, pet peeve is the technology becomes perfect in, you know, it's just, it becomes like a God almost. And, and, you know, that's not anybody. Well, you both have worked tech jobs. Mm -hmm. Stuff fails all the time. When you need it most. It does. Otherwise it wouldn't have a job. And when you need it most (laughs) is when it's going to fail. Right. There was that Murphy's law, I believe. So, and that's one of the thing. I that's another pet peeve of mine that they don't ever factor that in. Like everything's just too perfect. Yeah. So, what's the uh, the best example you have of believable troops in science fiction? Um, 
I think one I really liked was a book called Lance Jack. And I think it was Philip Richards wrote that. And he was, he it was is. a British army or British Marine Corps. And he writes about British Marines and he's got several books out and it's just like hard and gritty, just the way the guy comes to a new unit and gets it beat was, up. And, you know, it's just very, very hard. The first book in that, First book in that series is called Crow. And yeah. It's uh, C period, R period, Com- O period, W period. It's an acronym combat for replacement. Combat yeah. Replacement of War, which is yeah, yeah. It's a British acronym for for yeah. reinforcements, I think. But we are actually oh. trying to get him on. We're waiting. Everyone who's reading his series and loving it is waiting for him to come back from mm-hmm. deployment so he can write another yeah. one. But uh, we're um, he's really good friends with Tim Taylor, so he's trying to hook us up with an interview with cool, him. Yeah. He's, he's got really good stuff. So. Um, Michael Williamson. I really like his freehold series. And uh, one of the things I like okay. about these authors is when a new person comes in, they don't know the first thing about a firefight. I mean, they've been trained, but then they just kind of like freak out when the rounds first start flying and training kicks in. And that to me is, you know, that's just the way it works. People have to realize that, Hey, right. Shooting it's natural. (sighs) Someone's actually trying to make me, this is actually it. This is, it's happening now. And, you Mm -hmm. know, I just like to see that, that, that mental shift. And I think that really captures it. And plus, you know, some of these authors, they've been in the military, so they know, and they've got that experience that they can integrate into it. You know, they know that they're bullies when you first get to a unit. You know, you're going to have some very obnoxious, tough guy who's going to give you a hard time. And I think everybody in the military has seen that and experienced that. So then when you read it in a book, it's like, okay, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Cool. And that's the other thing that's that's fun to do is that I think everyone – I think because so many – because the American is a lot of people read the American media, they watch the American movies, they see that culture that I think there's a tendency to use that as the baseline for for the military. So I actually liked that with Crow and some of the others where they use like other nations, which have slightly different military mm-hmm. cultures and military terms and unit structure. I like seeing somebody mix yeah. that up. And it's- so that's one of the things I did like about um, Crow by Phil... Uh, oh, I'm Phil drawing a blank on his last name. Yeah. Richards, there we go. So talking about military culture, when you got out, usually we ask authors while they're in or about their military experience how, how it affected your writing. I think that's pretty obvious. But when you got out, how how has transitioning to civilian life affected um, your writing? Quite a bit. Uh, because when I got out, I started playing paintball and I started playing airsoft. And then I started seeing other people and how they reacted under fire and under pressure and things like that. And that was also a real eye opener. You know, I was in my unit in the Marine Corps for four years. You know, after I did my my boot camp and I went to the unit, I was with that specific unit, that platoon for my entire time. So I didn't see other units and other groups training all that much. We, I think one time we had the French Foreign Legion come on base, but I didn't get selected to train with them. Um, but then once I got out and then paintball and airsoft, I started interacting with other people, uh, special forces, a few Navy SEALs, um, Marine recon and stuff like that. And I got to see how they acted and behaved in these situations. I mean, it was, it really helped me kind of focus in on what my Marine Corps training had missed. You know, how, wow. I, I can imagine that would be, yeah, it, it was a shocker. You know, some of the people that, you know, they've never fired a paintball gun before and they get out there and it's really easy to suppress them. You know, you just hit their cover a few times, they put their head down, they keep it down, but you're not going to suppress us, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> another word no. or something like that. So, it's, so, it's, so when you were, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was to say, so when, um, oh, drawing a blank here. Oh, I just I was going to ask, speaking of paintball. So when I was kitting out, a lot of the, um, the mount training, the, uh, 
urban combat training, we were going to paintball attachments to our rifles mm-hmm. for the kill houses for training on, on urban ops. Was that something yeah. the Marines did uh, when you were in or no, they hadn't had started. They started? We had the miles gear. Yeah. It replaced. But the I was miles a gear. weirdo in that yeah, it, when I was in Hawaii on the weekend, I would go play paintball. And I saw it as very, I was very different from my fellow Marines, especially once I was able to drag them out to the paintball field. And then when we do live fires and stuff like that, you know, it just sets the mindset and it's great training because, you know, when we do a live fire exercise, you know, the the drill is, okay, you hear that first round, everybody takes cover, you know, and that first round would go off and people are like, oh, I should take cover now but I was already behind cover and looking for a target by the time they caught up. And then Mm -hmm. I realized, you know, playing with some of these paintball guys is they could look across the field and they say, you know, there should be a blade of grass sticking up over there. That means that somebody's laying on top of it. And they'd put a few rounds and get the guy, you know, and these were the people I went up against on the paintball field. And it was really enlightening to see that and then get my buddies out there. And, you know, it, it didn't always go well for us, you know, so it, well, that's the home team advantage in yeah, any, anything you do. But it I also, so, being a big, tough Marine, I, you know, it, it takes the ego down a few notches and makes you step back and start listening. I could see that. I definitely see the benefit of the paintball what was transitioning out. One, I, we've mentioned in our introduction mm-hmm. that you can cheat on the Miles gear, rub a little bit of shoe polish on it. And then it's still, it's only like you hear the dry CO2 pop mm-hmm. of you firing blanks, essentially. And, uh, and it's a light that you don't see. You never see anything moving. It's just, mm-hmm. it's like playing a video game almost more so. Um, and then if you get shot, you have to wait through the annoying beep while they, some, you know, whoever's hosting the, the judges are, I'm drawing yeah. a blank on what the term that was, but why they read it. The, right, why they read the uh, the cadre, read the card on your sleeve or whatever, saying, "Okay, did you die?" What? Whereas with paintball, yeah. there's no question yeah. where you got hit. <laughs> and so, the, and then the other part of that is when you're doing the uh, the buddy assaults, which is you know mm-hmm. I'm up, they see me, I'm down, where you do short charges and you cover each other to leapfrog forward. Um, there's something to be <laughs> yeah. said for watching the dirt pume up behind yeah. you or beside you or whatever yeah. from that paintball missing. Or not, but I mean, that definitely changes how you view it. Now, I did all that mm-hmm. training after Iraq, so I, I just keep thinking how much better that could have prepared yeah, us there, if we had done it before. Yeah, there's something very the eye-opening there. when you hear that that slam against your cover of them shooting at you. And it's like, yeah, yeah. Or right beside you as you're oh, charging yeah, forward. <laughs> now, what's the difference between paintball okay, and airsoft? So airsoft is like airsoft, paintball except for men. Um. <laughs> it shoots a six millimeter BB. Here's a key difference. In airsoft, you know, the guns might be a little expensive, but they look exactly like your real weapon. You know, I can, I've got like an airsoft Glock 19 and okay. a real Glock 19. I put them down in front of you. You will not be able to tell the difference. You could pick them up. You could play with them, except for the orange barrel on the Glock. You, you, you won't be able to tell. And it works the same way. So you pull the trigger, the slide goes back, and then it goes forward. When it's out of ammo, the slide locks to the rear. And the rifles are the same way. It's some of them. They don't always lock to the rear, but you have so to change you- magazines. They've got selective fire. Anything you put on your real M4, you can put on yep. an airsoft M4. And the range is longer. Including yeah. a bayonet if you're running out of BBs. And I've got a plastic trainer <laughs> bayonet, but we're not allowed to use those. <laughs> so how, like with a paintball if you get hit yeah. you've got that little red green whatever color i'm colorblind but whatever splash of color on your uniform it's pretty obvious you got it's hit how does that system. work with the and, and that's one of the flaws of airsoft oh, yeah. is you have to listen to it yeah and sometimes you'll get the welt, welt. <laughs> um but i've had paintball draw blood on me i don't think i've ever had airsoft draw blood oh. but i have had people get their teeth shut out because in, in airsoft they only they only require goggles, not full face protection. So it's it, it looks a lot more okay. realistic on a, at an airsoft event because you see people, you know, they're loading magazines. They've got M4 magazines. They've got AKs. You can identify the weapons. It's like he's got an M14. He's got an AK. He's got a M4. He's got an M249 saw. This guy over here has a M240 Bravo. You know they've those the real weapons translate directly into airsoft weapons. 
So you can get almost anything. So when I did it, it was, um, they were essentially blank almost like Mm -hmm. it was a replacement round. If I remember correctly that they attached to the M16. So I I didn't actually use the, the more, what you're talking about, the comical looking weapons Mm -hmm. for the, the yeah, you've got the Sims gear and the sim gear, as I understand, uses real, you can use the real weapon. Basically it's a, a paintball gun, a paintball that goes with a regular shell. So you, it works just like a regular yeah. bullet. Yeah, that's what I. Re- that's what we had. Yeah. So if you got too close to when oh, you yeah, fire, it hurts. I mean, you're still you're going to shoot somebody. But, well, I'd like to know that that I work in these. I work for a uh, in a school environment. Mm-hmm. Once in a while, the police come and train, and they they train with paintball rounds, nine millimeter, uh, two two six, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, two two three, and a lot of times they leave these. <laughs> They leave a mess behind. So once in a while, if you look around long enough, you can find some of these things. They're the exact shape mm-hmm. and, and size of of a real round. So they, they fire yeah. them out of the real the real firearms. That's what we did. For the, if I'm remembering my training correctly. So, all right. Well, it's uh, about an hour in. So this is where we start wrapping it up. So uh, we'll start with, are there any scientific breakthroughs that, uh, that you're excited by that could affect 3d printers. the world of science fiction? Uh, at large? I'm fascinated with 3d printers. Okay. The, you know, you can print food. Um, we're not quite printing good food yet, but everything from printing food to drones. <laughs> and when you think about it, you know, if you print an army of drones, yeah. Drones are becoming a thing and a 3d printer that'll print out a bunch of drones. They have those, they're working on that. So you can really throw a lot of drones at the enemy, you know, and specialized drones. Well, plus, Mm -hmm. plus eventually the plans will get out and civilians will start making, making the, the printers that Mm -hmm. make the drones in their own garage. It's it's like, I'm really fascinated by 3d printers and the capabilities there. You know, um, okay, probably not the most. What about you? Pardon? What's that? Oh, oh I thought he was done. I was going to ask Chris what he was following. Yeah, I, but I, you're I, still talking about 3D, 3D printers. printers there's just so much capability there, and it might not be the most uh, glorious thing, but then the potential is just astronomical. You know. I can't wait until they come up with a polymer mm-hmm. that's actually as strong as steel. They're getting close, but as soon as they can do that, you could you could order auto parts and go pick them up thirty minutes later, we'll printed, ready to go for anything, or print them yourself if you have a printer. Right? They they'll they'll never mm-hmm. be out of parts because you can print them right there. Well, they could always run out of the ink if you would, <laughs> but never correct. <laughs> <laughs> all right what about you chris are there any uh tech that you're watching that you're excited by yeah so there's a company called cardiogram who produces a phone app that analyzes the data collected by iWatches watches regarding heart rate so here's their list of claims as to what this this software can do and it's it's just for the the i watch right now but i'm i'm sure that they might be able to to tweak it later for other ones, Samsung gear, stuff like that. But the first claim is that the heart is connected to every other part of the body via the nervous system. Well, that goes without saying, but that doesn't really mean anything. Claim number two is that in one part, what happens in one part of the body affects every other part of the body. Well, I could see possibly, and claim three, because the heart is part of the body. Claim four is that they have developed their own AI built into their servers. I, so I guess what happens is the watch collects the info, sends it to the app on your phone. The app on your phone sends it to their servers. And this AI called Deep Heart is able to discover pre-diabetes symptoms based solely on the heart rate info from your iWatch. So this is like a, a remote tricorder. This, this server could be anywhere, even on the moon. And that they they're able to to give you an alert and then send you to your doctor to go get confirmation that you have prediabetes. It's just it, it's fascinating what AIs are doing and and how they're how they're tweaking technology. That's cool. 
Yeah. Right. Wow, everybody's thinking about it. <laughs> I mean, it definitely is. It's interesting. So I give you that. Good find. Mm-hmm. All right. What about you, Jerry? Um, I've actually just been nerding out lately over the whole Tesla roaster in space. So I've been staring at all these pictures of the, uh, the um, star man and, and reading the articles about how, um, the woe is me. It's going to crash into the earth in a million years, assuming the earth is even still standing. It's just, it's problem. interesting, right? And so, and it's also, I, I don't imagine that the Tesla roadster is built for reentry. So I don't, I don't foresee it, uh, it's surviving the, uh, re-entry process enough to be a concern but um especially after you know however long in space and taking right, all getting, the yeah. my, getting pummeled by micrometeorites right and of course you know object in motion and all that that's not to assume a meteor might mm-hmm. not hit it and knock it off course just nudge it you know like so much is unknown because it's essentially a, it's a free-flying uh, orbital or um, body in the in the solar system now. So it's, it's definitely interesting. So I've been nerding out over the pictures um, and I've got a link we'll put in the show notes about the, uh, why everyone is saying it looks fake uh, because basically in, in a nutshell, there's nothing distorting the color perception because there's no atmosphere. So the colors look mm-hmm. crisper on the uh, roadster. Yep. <laughs> so there's, there's been some, some of the flat earthers are speculating that that's actually another sound studio. Somewhere, because it looks so crisp. Clearly, that's not space or something. I don't know. What else? It's interesting. <laughs> but thank you for uh, for coming on, Bill. So, where can uh, listeners find you? Well, um, I tend to spend a lot of time on Facebook, as you know, and I've got a author page on Facebook of William S. Frisbee, and I've got my own personal website where I put my blog and. You know, links to books on williamsfrisbee.com. And those are usually the places I hang out. But you can also find um, – I post a lot of my military stuff on millsf.com and on the Facebook page, Military SF 101. And I've got the links for all of that in the show notes. So you can just click on those instead of trying to scribble out on your uh, your notepads, people. What about us, Chris? Where can they find us? Our website is www.sfshenanigans.com. Our Twitter is at SFS, that's Sierra Foxtrot Sierra underscore show. And our email is podcast at sfshenanigans.com. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time, where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. Boom.